you everybody for thank you for joining me today it's a, it's a real pleasure to talk to you on this uh, un day of international education um, so do you sometimes wish that your students were had just a bit more proactivity just a bit more responsibility for their own learning um, and that they would that they would manage their own learning a bit more without you having to push them I think one of the things that the pandemic has shown us as teachers is that our students aren't really that good at managing their own learning. And this has made me look into the issue. What can we do to help our students become better at being independent learners? And that's really what I'm going to share with you today. What I've found and what I think will be helpful ideas if this is what you want to do. Okay, so first of all, let's think about what we actually mean by independent learning. Uh, what I want you to do is to go to the chat box and try and write in there some examples or an example of what you think of as in your experience with a student, what they might do if they are an independent learner, just an example of the kind of thing they might do, uh, which would show to you their independence as a learner. So I'm going to try and see uh, if anybody's putting anything in. So looking up related information online, yeah, doing their own research. Those are nice ideas, yeah. Um, I think if you look at the pictures here, you can see, yeah, looking into new vocabulary in the dictionary, project works, reflect themselves, yeah, doing that homework on time, um, exploring for themselves, don't always ask for help. Um, E-learning, doing a project in pairs and groups and that's one thing I self-motivated I want to say about these pictures you see some pictures students are on their own and sometimes they're in groups and which ones are more independent well you can't really tell from that because a student can be working on their own but still be very dependent on the teacher to tell them what to do and when to stop and students can be working in a group and be really uh, independent in terms of deciding what they're going to do how they're going to do it when they've done it well enough Checking in pairs is a nice one. Uh, yeah, they, they, they're fond of doing discussions. They're doing their research. So lots of great ideas coming up here. They look up in self-study uh, materials. So these are the kind of things, I think we're on the same page when it comes to understanding what we mean by um, independent learning. Yeah, so I asked you to do that. I was also gonna ask you to give examples of students behaving without independence. I think you, you get the idea. So I, th I think we'll move on from there. So let's just do a little bit of uh, kind of think about our terms and what we mean. So independent learners manage and improve their own learning. And they believe they can and should control and improve their own learning. They have agency. This is a, a, a jargon word, which really means uh, it's talking about the beliefs of students about their abilities and their responsibilities. And they make their own decisions about how to improve their learning. So they have autonomy and they monitor their progress and they adjust their approach accordingly. So they self-regulate. So I just wanted to say that these are all part of really the same thing. What makes independent learners is their agency and their autonomy and self-regulation. And I say that because sometimes people will say, what's the difference between these? And, and there are subtle differences, but they're all kind of fishing in the same water uh, about making independent learners. Okay, so why is it important to develop independent learners? I think most teachers already know that it's important, but what I'm doing here is just gonna to bring together some of the, the strongest reasons so you can reflect on why you're trying to do this. I think the first point is, it's about relevance. The more control the student has over their learning, the more relevant it will be to them. That's in, relevant in terms of level, in terms of the topic and contents, in terms of the skills to focus on. And the more relevant it is, the more effective and motivating their learning will be. Second point is that every class is made up of students with different levels of ability. And I think this is one of the biggest challenges for any teacher, uh, but particularly in K-12 classes where classes are organized by age, not level. Um, and as students, as teachers, we try different techniques for differentiation in the class, 
But an important part of the solution is that is for students themselves to recognize that they are all different and that they need to think carefully about their own needs. Um, third reason I would say it's important is that it takes longer to learn a language than there is time in the school timetable for it. Uh, even before the pandemic, this was a real big challenge. A lot of classroom time is lost in administrative tasks. Many students may only get uh, probably around 60 hours of real learning in a school year, uh, but it can take 200 to 250 hours, guided learning hours to get from, uh, for example, from A2 to B1. So where are those other hours gonna come from? They have to be hours that the students put in, homework, self-access, independent learning. Uh, fourth point I'd make is that when we talk about motivating our students, we distinguish, distinguish between extrinsic motivation, uh, which is where there's some external reward, which might be um, you know, passing an exam or a financial bribe or a punishment, fear of avoiding a punishment, um, or there's intrinsic motivation. And that's where you do something because you enjoy doing it. An intrinsic motivation is stronger and more sustainable. So we need to find ways to make our students feel that learning is something they want to do in itself. And all the things we do to make them independent learners overlap with developing their intrinsic motivation. So making their learning more relevant, giving them more control, helping them to see their own success, et cetera. And the, the final point I'd make there is that when we help our students to become independent learners, we are helping them to take control of their lives, to see that they can and should take responsibility to achieve what they want in life. So this is a frame of mind, it's agency, a growth mindset that will help them far beyond their English lessons. It'll help them across all of their education and throughout their lives. So it's really important uh, for us as teachers to be helping them in this way. Okay, so what can we do as teachers? Can we help them become more independent? Well, I'm gonna talk about four things uh, which I think help. First of all, to help them plan and set goals for their learning. Secondly, to help them develop effective learning habits and strategies. Thirdly, to motivate them to manage their own learning. And this is about uh, giving control to the students and setting engaging activities. And fourthly, to help them evaluate their own learning. Okay, so the first one, help your students plan and set goals for their learning. Um, and this is about helping your students to be clearer about what they're trying to achieve. And there are three things we can focus on. Uh, first of all, being clear about what their mid to long-term goals are for learning English. And you know, sometimes this is, it may simply be to pass an exam. Sometimes it's, they need English for the career that they're hoping for. But sometimes it's, it's uh, more about how they see themselves as somebody who can speak the language. And I'm going to come back to that one, the L2 self, to explain in more detail. The second thing is about having a plan to study English, uh, and that's about scheduling intermediary goals. I'll come back to that in a second. And thirdly, it's about being clear about your objective as a student in your, the study task that you're doing at that moment. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that as well. I'm going at quite a pace here because I want to get through quite a lot of stuff and give you some time for questions uh, at the end. Okay, um, so the first one I was saying, this is about the kind of long-term um, objective, a goal in learning a language. And it's partly about seeing yourself as someone who has mastered that language. When they say L2, it means uh, language to second language. Of course, some of your students, the, learning English is their third or fourth language, but it's just a, a term to mean uh, speaking an additional language. So how can you help your students think about where they want to get to as a speaker of English? Well, one, one thing you can do is to ask them to think of somebody who has learned the language and who they admire. Um, it may be, in this case, it's in this picture, I don't know if you recognize who it is, it's a footballer, a Brazilian footballer who plays for Manchester United, I think, 
uh, called Fred. Um, and, you know, he's a great footballer. You'd like football. And he's also, you know, he's learned English. And uh, that's the kind of person. But it might be a, a musician or a actor or a, um, an activist. Someone like Greta Thunberg uh, is a, a, a really nice example. Someone who you admire, they admire, and that they would like to see themselves as that person. Another kind of technique is that you can ask them to imagine themselves in five years after they've successfully studied English for five years. What will they be like? What will they be able to do in English? What will they sound like? So ask them to write that down and just keep that as a, a kind of as the target that they're aiming for. Or another little tactic is to tell them that the, the language fairy godmother is going to grant them five wishes for their learning of English. So they can ask for five special wishes about their, their ability to speak English or their ability to use English. And they can write down those five wishes. So that again helps them to think, what do I really want to achieve? What do I, what's my real goal? Okay, so all of these are trying to get them to think about um, what their target is and creating a target which is relevant and meaningful to each of them. So the next thing uh, I mentioned was in this kind of goal setting planning stages is to develop plans for learning. Uh, and as I said, there's kind of two sides to this. There's a scheduling and there is um, in interim goals. So for scheduling, um, of course, everyone has their own way of doing this, but you can give them some suggestions to help them think about what works for them. So they can, they should have a, a weekly or a monthly planner. It could be the one they use for everything, or it could be one dedicated to learning English. But in that planner, they're going to put in answers to these questions. You know, how much time are they going to, what, realistically, how much time can they spend learning English each week? And then when are they going to do it? Is it going to be 10 minutes in the morning before breakfast? Is it going to be half an hour after lunch every day? Is it going to be an hour three evenings a week when are they go when are they going to do that scheduling it in and then the what is for that semester or that term what are they really going to focus on is it their listening or, or grammar or vocabulary or a combination of those so it's just getting a rough outline of a plan and then to set themselves some intermediary goals so it might be something like learn 20 new words a week 30 minutes, listen to 30 minutes of English podcasts each week, watch one film of Eng in English each month, to set these kind of goals uh, for that semester, which will um, you know, give them, help them on that target that they're going for. The third point I said in this area is that they need to be much clearer about what they're actually trying to learn or what they're trying to improve in each activity that they're doing. And as teachers, experienced teachers, we, we have ways of doing this, making our students think about what they're, they're learning at any point. And, and this is one approach, the KWL chart, which is know, want to know and learned. So if you're starting a new topic, a new area of language, um, at the beginning, you ask your students to write down in the first and second columns what they know and what they would like to know. And then when you've finished that lesson or that, that group of lessons, what have they actually learned? And it's just a way of making them um, reflect more on what they're actually doing. If this was language, it might be, for example, it might be an area of grammar um, or functional language. It could be talking about the future or um, giving directions. That might be the topic. So, um, you know, what do they know and what do they want to know? Or it could be, it could be an area of vocabulary. Um, another way to kind of deal with those immediate um, awareness of what you're doing is if you're starting a new unit in a, in a textbook, a course book, um, often the textbooks will give you a list of the can-do statements, the things that they're going to be able to do by the end of the unit. That's the idea. So you take those and you ask the students to put on a scale of one to five, for example, how much do they want that skill? How important is it to them? You know, and they might say, yeah, this one is really important. And this one, maybe, yeah, I don't know. So you do that first, so they're thinking about what they're learning. And then when you finish the unit, you ask them, well, how well did you do on each of these? And it's quite an interesting comparison to compare what they really wanted, what was important to them with what they actually succeeded in learning. 
So all those were about their planning and thinking about what they're trying to do. The second area I want to look at is how you can help your students develop effective learning habits and strategies. And um, here, there are lots of ways of talking about learning strategies. Here, I'm really focusing on helping students to manage their learning. Uh, and within that, we're going to look at six key areas, um, which are typical of successful learners. So obtaining and using learning resources, developing effective learning habits, using learning techniques, uh, motivational management, making use of sources of help, and creating an effective environment for learning. So these are things which people who are good at learning uh, you know, are good at doing these particular types of action. So what can we do to help our students develop those skills and, and strategies and techniques? So we take the first one that they need to kind of gather suitable resources for themselves so to help them learn and of course they get a textbook and they have you as a teacher the best resource ever but there you know there are a lot of resources out there that can help them for different things um, and you might you might ask them to create their own list of resources for themselves you might ask them as a class to pull together into a joint list of resources. I always feel that you have to be a little bit careful about who your students are. You know, if you've got a group of teenagers, asking them to put links to websites is always a risky thing, uh, unless you really trust your students. Um, so it, maybe it's best for students to do it individually, unless they are you know, adults. Um, so and I think it's really good for you to have your own list of suggestions that you might give to them if they're asking. It's not that they should just copy your list, but you have that up your sleeve. Um, and so the kind of things that I might recommend to people if they ask me is, you know, if they're asking for podcasts, I think the BBC has a really good um, site, lots of episodes there, which are suitable for learners. Um, if you've got young primary school or, or young uh, junior secondary, um, there's a site called Pickle, uh, which is really good for um, young learner uh, podcasts. Maybe they want a vocab app. Um, the British Council has a really nice one called My Word Book, uh, which is useful for practicing and learning vocab. If they want to improve their writing. I think there's a really nice uh, app called writeandimprove.com where you write in and, and the system gives you uh, feedback. If you like listening or you want to improve your listening, there's a great site called uh, TED Ed, which has um, TED Talks and lots of exercises to go with them, probably more for adults. For speaking, there's ELSA, um, you may be familiar with. The British Council, again, has a, a really nice pronunciation app called Sounds Right. Or you may be exam practice and they want uh, help with preparing for IELTS. Again, British Council has, has, a, has a nice one for that. So you, you draw those lists up for, for yourself, but also get your students to draw up their own lists. OK. Second thing is developing effective learning habits. Um, and in many ways, these are the same techniques that you might use to develop or change any behavior in your life. Um, so here we're applying them to language learning. Um, for example, this implementation tensions, that's about uh, statements of habits that you're going to start. Uh, and it's really good to set up those kind of statements and to share them with other people. Um, but they have to be detailed. Uh, so saying what you're going to do in this example, I will revise vocabulary for how long? For 10 minutes. Where? In, your, in my room. When? Before breakfast. So these kind of um, statements, implementation intentions, really effective for, for, for getting uh, to de develop good habits. Another one is habit stacking. Um, and this is where you link a new habit to um, a habit that is already established. So you, new one added onto, stacked onto uh, an old one. So for example, before I take a shower, which I do every morning, I will read one paragraph in English or on my bus journey to work, I will listen to 10 minutes of English. So it's linking a, an old, a new habit to an old one. Um, another tactic for habits is often the most difficult bit is getting started. Um, and thinking, oh, no, I've got to do all this work. So the thing is to make the habit focused on something very small, maybe just two minutes worth of work, just so that you get started. And then typically 
you'll carry on afterwards or your students will carry on afterwards uh, beyond the two minutes. So for example, it might be something like read one page of this English book. I'm just gonna do that. Or learn five words or listen to two minutes of news in English or write two sentences in English, something very small, get you started. That's the first hurdle. Okay, so the next, oh, sorry. I just wanted to point out that, that the, the words and terms I was using there uh, come from a person called James Clear, who's written a book called Atomic Habits. If you're into how to improve habits, uh, that's a great book to read. Okay, so now I want to look not so much at learning habits, but more learning techniques. And these are the ways that we do the learning. Habits are around finding time to, to do activities, but learning techniques is how we do it. Um, and there's a lot of educational research investigating which techniques are effective for learning. And of course, there's a lot of personal variation. And in some ways, language learning can be a bit different from other educational subjects. But um, these are three techniques which are consistently found to be very effective um, in learning and in language learning. So the first one is retrieval, which is a bit of a jargon word for test yourself. Um, and you know, one of the things you can do is, or stu your students can do is, uh, can they remember? Can I remember these thirty words? So these thirty words, I know I've learned them. Let me let me test myself. Very simple. Or can I redo this exercise which I've just completed? Or which I just got feedback from and, and this time get everything right. So it's testing yourself and again it sounds simple but it, it's a very effective um, technique. Second one is spaced practice and this really the idea here is to spread your practice out over time. It's, it's not so effective just to have three hours of concentrated study. Uh, it's much better to spread it out and come back to things after, after a, a period of uh, time. Um, that's, that is more likely to put something into your long-term memory. So for example, you complete a grammar exercise and you think it's really important. So you just put a note, I'm going to come back to this next month. I'm going to do it again. And that's really effective. And then the third one is what's called deliberate practice. And this is where you push yourself to improve on each attempt. So you start slow and you build up to improve on each attempt. So for example, with your speaking, you might have a, a speaking task, you record yourself, you listen to your, rec your recording, and then you think, how can I improve that? And you re-record it this time better. So that's a deliberate practice approach. Okay, how are we doing? I think we're doing okay. Motivational management, important part of helping your students manage their learning is to realize that they are the ones who are most who are best at motivating themselves. Uh, we do what we can as teachers, parents do what they can, but really it's the student who has to motivate themselves. Um, so other things we can do to help them manage that? Well, one is um, streaks. I don't know if you're familiar with this word. I, I suspect it's been imported into lots of languages, but when you do something regularly for a, a period of time in an unbroken chain, um, that's a, a habit streak and you can get your students to set up targets and rewards for streaks. Here's an example. I will have a takeaway on Friday if I complete my 10 minutes practice for seven days. Or variety in activities. One of the problems with building a habit of doing something regularly is it can get boring uh, if you don't keep variety in there. And I, I find things like um, Duolingo, you know, they're very well designed, but they do tend to be the same thing again and again. So get your students to be thinking, planning, um, variety, vocab check, listening to a song, watch a video, grammar task, read a blog, post comments. And then the third point is to motivate yourself is to really keep track of, to see that you're making progress. There's nothing more motivating than seeing you're making progress. And one uh, good way of doing this is to keep a portfolio, ask your students to keep a portfolio of recording of themselves speaking and writing from the beginning of the course, and then they can listen to that and see how they're getting better uh, throughout the course. Okay, the fifth uh, way that uh, type of technique, which is really good, is, is which is important for your students to master, is to make use of sources of help in their learning. And, and this will depend on circumstances, but it might be that they can join an online English study group where people voluntarily come together and study together. They might meet up once a week for lunch with people who 
who are chatting English. Either they're very good at English or maybe they're just like them, but that's what they're going to do. Or they uh, might, for example, keep a notebook of questions that they would like to ask the teacher or someone who speaks English when they get the chance. So they can really make the most of their time when they are with a knowledgeable person, an expert. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to just uh, think about is how you can encourage your students to create an effective environment for learning. And of course, this varies hugely. Students have very different situations. Some will have their own room, their own laptop, a supportive family. For others, it can be a battle to get space and time and support. Uh, but here are four suggestions uh, you know, for students to for you to ask your students to do to, to improve their environment for learning. So first of all, to find, to establish a quiet place to study English, to keep a vocab notebook next to their beds, to put their language learning app top of their favorites, to organize their uh, computer files so that they can find their study notes exercises quickly. So the, le the least resistance to studying, the easier it is to keep going. Okay, next thing I'm gonna uh, go on to is motivating students to take charge of their learning. And this is a successful independent learners. Um, they have both the skill and the will. As Barbara Sinclair said, she, she wrote the, the book, uh, Learning to Learn, very popular book. And um, that's what we're gonna focus on the will bit. And there's two things we can really look at, mainly about giving students more control over their learning. And then secondly, uh, creating engaging activities. And when we talk about giving control from teacher to student, uh, we have to think of this as going in steps. You don't just throw them in the deep end. Uh, so you start with teacher directed where you're telling them what to do and how to do it. You move to teacher supported where you are helping them to do things. And then you move to learner directed where you're giving them the chance and the choice. So that where can you give them choices? in an English language program. Well, there are lots of possible places. Um, you know, which te texts are they going to use for the reading task? Which questions to answer? Topics, who they work with, etc. What I'd like you to do is just to look through this list and think, which of these for your students, because all students are different, for your students, which ones do you think, yes, you could? You could give them a choice on that. You'd be comfortable doing that. Are there some which you would say, no, 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 I definitely can't do that now, not yet anyway. Or are there some you think, well, maybe, possibly I could try it. So do you wanna, let me go and look to the chat and see, sorry, I'm not able to watch chat as I'm talking. Uh, so if you've been chatting away to me, I'm sorry, I haven't seen it. All of them, okay, someone, Fernando has said, great confidence. Uh, before each lesson should be motivated, use different videos, yeah. Okay, primary, year two primary of spelling cards, yeah. Okay, it's a little difficult to access the, okay, okay. Great, so people are tuning in, nice tips. All of them, some of them, okay, so you're thinking about it. So that's, that's fine, that's all I, all I wanted from you was to think about which ones you might consider. Some of them you might say, definitely not. Some of them you think, well, let me try it, see what happens. Okay, um, and if we were together in a big group, I'd be asking you now, uh, can you tell me some pros and some cons of giving control to your students? Again, it depends very much on, on, on the students, how old they are, um, you know, how, used to how familiar they are with being asked to take control what the ethos of the school is a lot of these things uh, will affect your your choices um, and, and, and i'm sure a lot of you under pros would have things like um yeah it increases their motivation it um means that they can do things which are most useful to them it's building up their independence on the on the con side you might be saying that they maybe they wouldn't choose the activities which are really useful for them, they'll just choose activities which are easy, or maybe they won't take it seriously. Uh, or also, as a teacher, it's difficult for you to 
manage what they're doing, to, to see their progress, to monitor them if they're doing different things. So those, there are definitely challenges and difficulties of giving control to them. Um, so we, if we had more time, we would have a really interesting conversation about it. But so you, you're just going to say, have to save that up for the, for the teacher's room after uh, when you next go to school. But what we can do is that there are challenges. We can do things which will make it easier, better, more likely to be successful. And, and there's five things I want to suggest uh, that you can use to, to make it easier and better rather than just throwing them in the deep end and seeing what happens. Because what I've seen, I've seen teachers give control to students. It's a bit of a disaster. And then they say, never again. Uh, so rather than that, let's plan it and, and do it in a managed way. So the scaffolding, structure, learner-centered, flexibility, and visible monitoring. So I'm going to go through each of those with a little, some examples. I'm watching the clock go, so I don't want to spend too much time. But scaffolding is when you support your students uh, to do a task which, if you just gave it to them uh, without any support, they may uh, be overwhelmed. So let's say you've got a project to produce a poster to promote healthy living. And I think you know every teacher in the world has probably given this project at some point to their students. Um, and it's a really nice project, but um, if you just give it to them without any support, any scaffolding, uh, some will manage and some won't. And you might get disruption, et cetera. So you want to support them as much as possible. So first of all, ask yourself, what are the different areas of knowledge or skill they need to do this well? What's the language they need? What's the information they need? And, and do they need skill in putting it all together? And then how can you help them with any of those? Do you just need to give them, for example, um, an example? Uh, you could give them an example of a poster uh, with shows, which shows them how to lay it out, for example. Um, or you might give them a text, reading text, which has got a lot of information and vocabulary, which is useful. So how can you help them with that? And then the, the last bullet point there, what stages can you break it up into um, to allow you to check their progress? So you don't just give it to them and then come back an hour later. You, know, you want to give it to them, but have different stages. So the first stage might be to come up with some content, some ideas of what is healthy and what's not healthy. The next stage might be to come up with a title Next one might be to lay out, the, to decide the layout. Uh, next one might be to do a first draft. So having stages where you can check, you can say in 10 minutes you need to do this, and then you just make sure it doesn't go, uh, it doesn't go crazy. Another thing you can do to help your students become more in control is to establish routines. And it, it doesn't mean you do this every time, all the time but it just means it's a familiar routine which you, you often use. Uh, so for example, I've got an example here of a writing task. Um, and if I was doing a writing task with my students, a typical routine for me would be uh, to give a reading task first, which introduces the topic, the vocabulary, and it kind of acts as a model text. We check the vocabulary, we examine the structure of the text, we generate or they generate ideas for their writing task. They organize their ideas, produce a draft, they share that draft and they comment on it, and then they revise it and then they present it or send it. And because they know that's the kind of routine, when they're in the middle, if they're kind of getting ahead on something, they know what they can do to, to work on next. You know, they can start to take control because they know there's a, there's a pattern to it. If we had time, if we were together, sitting together somewhere, I would ask you to come up with your routine, for example, for listening tasks, but we'll move on. Okay, learner-centered, um, in that transition from teacher-directed to learner-directed, you also want it to be learner-centered. And what I mean by that, learner-directed means the learner's making decisions, but learner-centered means it's about the student. Uh, so it's focusing on the student themselves. So you, you may want to make sure that the task activity has got learner-generated content. Uh, you, if you're working online, you might use Padlet or Jamboard or something like that. And students can write about their own experiences on topic, what they like or dislike, picture, their own pictures they can bring, words and phrases and ideas. So it's content that comes from them. They can use other students. Uh, someone mentioned right at the beginning that students you know, go straight to ask questions to the teacher before even thinking about it. Uh, I quite like these two techniques here. One is three before me, 
which is that students are only allowed to ask you a question if they've asked three other students first. And uh, that's kind of a rule in the class. Another one is, this works if you've got students organized into groups, for example, around a table, is that students are only allowed to ask you, or you'll only answer a question from a student if all the students in that group on that table put up their hand at the same time. Because it's quite a nice little tactic because it means that they have to discuss the question before they ask you. Just getting students to do things. You know, if there are new words uh, to be written on the board, ask a student to do it. If there's some assessing to do, ask them to assess themselves and more detail on that in a, in a, in a minute. If you've got uh, new vocabulary, get them to teach each other. If you've got a, a set of new vocabulary, divide it into two, give each group uh, their set of vocabulary, they research what it means, and then you put them into pairs across from the two different groups so that they can teach their words to other students. Uh, develop their own questions for presentation. Maybe the students are gonna, you're asking students to give a presentation, and, but before they give it, they have to write three questions about it, about their own presentation, which they can give to the other students to ask them. Uh, and it might sound a bit funny, but it's, it's a way of getting them to think about things and take control uh, of, of the activity in the classroom. Flexibility really helps with this, um, this transition from teacher to student control. So if you have open-ended activities, creative writing, story arguments, projects, just using visual prompts for speaking, it's more open-ended. So it allows students who, you know, some who are able to push ahead and some who are gonna go at a slower pace, it, it, it works better for that kind of variety. To add a stretch option. So, um, you know, if they're doing an exercise where there's new vocab, um, you're gonna ask the students who have finished first to write it up on the board. Or if the students who finish first, they should record themselves you know, speaking this and then correct themselves. Or students who finish first should uh, give reasons for their answers. So just having these things up your sleeve to um, add flexibility to a task. Another kind of flexibility is to change groupings. Um, it depends how you do it, but quite often teachers will tend to put strong students together and weak students together, you know, to, according to their level. Uh, but mix it up occasionally between, so you have strong and weak students together just again that flexibility which makes them think about and uh, take control of what's happening and then the last point is tracking and monitoring progress i think i said earlier that this is one of the challenges of giving control to students is being able to see what they're actually doing um, and there are three things you can do one is log books and these can be electronic or, or printed hard uh, uh, paper log books and it um and they should just they should be there to um to record what they are, what they've done, so a journal, what they're going to do, and also where you can put feedback on how they're doing. Um, you also ask them to create portfolios, um, and this can be recordings of their speaking, pieces of writing work, could be um, lists of things that they've read or listened to. Uh, another thing is posters. Um, where they, they create posters to put on the wall of the classroom with shared plans or what the goals are for the semester, uh, what the plans are for a project, ground rules, recurrent errors, uh, favorite vocab. All of these really are just ways of making public what the students are doing uh, and to make it more visible um, for you as a teacher. Now, the other thing I was going to say about motivating students, of course, is trying to um, stop that inter independent working being boring, because that is one of the challenges. And as teachers, we're always trying to make our activities engaging. Um, and I think it's useful to think sometimes about what are the things that make an activity engaging for us. Um, and there's lots of research into the different factors that affect our engagement. But I'd like to mention three that are worth bearing in mind. When you, when you think about this. First one is accomplishment. So we're motivated to get that sense of achievement, which is, which, which is reinforced by the chemical dopamine um, that comes when we reach a target. Um, and so as a teacher, one of the things you can do is to kind of set up, create short-term targets for your students so that they can have achievable targets, so they can have a sense of accomplishment. Um, so might learn these words in two minutes or, or, or 
set a time limit, complete this set of uh, questions in four minutes. Um, so numbers and times, or to create an element of competition um, between students. I don't know if you know this tic-tac-toe or, or noughts and crosses. Maybe you're checking through some homework and instead of just going through the questions one by one, you divide your students into two groups and then you go to the first question in the homework and you ask it to one group. If they get it right, they can put a cross. And then if they get it wrong, the turn goes to the other group. And in this way, you're going through the answers of the exercise, the homework, but it's got a little bit of competition uh, embedded in it. Another thing that motivates us is curiosity about things we don't know. And you, there's things you can do. You can create cliffhangers. Uh, you can stop a story before the end and only finish it in the next lesson. Um, other things you can do is kind of puzzles are, are feed into our um, curiosity, anagrams. I, can, I like this uh, homework sheet I saw a teacher made where it's new vocabulary about nature, and but she put all the vocabulary into anagrams um, and it just added a little bit more engagement to what might have been a little boring activity. And then fun. And of course, um, you know, we know that fun is engaging. And I imagine there are lots of academic researchers looking into what is fun. Um, but we kind of know certain things. We know that visual impact, if things look great, if, there's really, if you've got some really interesting photos, pictures, um, that can really engage your students. And also music. I mean, I've always loved using songs in classes um, because just music adds something enjoyable to the, to the lesson. And one of the things um, I discovered, which, is, which um, you probably know already, something called Lyrics Training. It's a wonderful website. They have lots of all the popular songs there and they have these gap fill exercises, which you can adjust to uh, the level. So lots of different levels for the same um, for the same song. So it's, it's really great fun. Okay, the last thing now, I'm running out of time uh, if I want to give you time for questions. So how can you help them evaluate their own learning? So, which is really important part of becoming independent learning. So the first thing I would say is that don't start with evaluating their own English if, if you're starting this process, because evaluating your English is actually one of the most difficult things. Even as teachers, we, we struggle to evaluate our students. So um, that's kind of not the first, that shouldn't be your starting point. Personally, I recommend asking them to evaluate how much they enjoyed an activity or how difficult they found it, or whether they everybody participated or whether everybody collaborated. You know, those kind of things, which is easy for them to evaluate and that gets them used to evaluating activities and things in the lesson. Another kind of early stage is to use exit tickets. I don't know if you use these. Um, this is where students are only, they've got a piece of paper and they're only allowed to leave the class if they hand in the completed exit ticket. And so you can ask them just to complete the sentence, today I learned, blah, blah, blah. they complete that, that's their exit ticket. Or traffic lights, slightly more complicated. Uh, I saw somebody do this. Um, they've got red, yellow, green. So they have to say something which stopped their learning, something which was kind of a new idea or a question, and then something they actually learned, which is green. So they complete that exit ticket. They, you collect them and let them out the door. Okay, now when you're trying to get them to self assess on their language, uh, there are some important things to kind of help develop that skill. Um, and so I would say these four things are worth, it's both for self-assessment and for peer assessment. Um, so first of all, especially to begin with, just focus on one thing or two things in the, uh, in the assessment. So imagine they're doing, a, the, the students are coming forward to speak in a show and tell activity and you asking the other students to evaluate them. Well, just one, you know, what's the student loud and clear enough? That's the only thing. Well, possibly two things, you know, was there not too much headed, hesitating? So at the most, two things. Keep, don't ask them to evaluate vocabulary and grammar and or pronunciation and all those things as well. Secondly, balance encouragement and correction. And this is, this is for you as a teacher, but certainly for self-assessment and peer assessment. One positive comment and then one correction or improvement. It's really good to give students uh, phrases for their feedback. It was good when you, or you should try to, or you shouldn't say. 
Um, and then it's also good to give them criteria uh, to use. So in this example, uh, I'm not sure where it, oh, yeah, it came from a site called Twinkle, um, where students self-assess their own writing, and it's given them these criteria to, to evaluate, and that, that's really helpful. And I think similar to that, it's, it's really good to get students used to looking at descriptors of what is good and what's not good. And you can find these all over the internet um, related to exams, particularly, but other places. It might even be in your course book. Or you might have codes for errors, which you use as a teacher, but you can get your students to use the codes when they're evaluating their peers writing. Um, so it just makes it much more, they think much more about what they're evaluating. This is a little technique um, I picked up from somebody. What he did was getting students to self-correct when they're speaking. So he was, in this case, he was focused on them adding the third person S, third person singular S, so he goes. Um, and if they forgot, he wrote S on a piece of pink paper and put it on the wall, and if they forgot, to the, their third person S, singular S, he would just point to the S on the wall and they would, ah, oh, yes, and correct themselves. Then he, um, sorry, this, this person was Herbert Puchter, who's a very good author. Um, then he just put the pink sheet without any S on it and he just had to point to it and they all remembered, ah, oh, yes, must put S on the end. And then he tried it with other things. So, uh, for example, pronunciation of th, you know, if the students are struggling, if they make a mistake, he just points to that and they, and they rewind themselves to think about what did they say and try to correct themselves. So I thought it was a really good technique to, without interrupting them too strongly, just to get them to um, correct themselves. Okay, I think, yeah, so I think, I think I've covered everything quite quickly. There's four areas. How can you help your students become independent learners? There's four things I talked about. Help them plan and set goals for their learning. Help them develop effective learning habits and strategies. Motivate them to manage their own learning, give control, set engaging activities, and help them to evaluate their own learning. And that is it. And I think I'm going to move on to questions. And I hope you got lots of questions. As Helen Keller said, a well-educated mind will always have more questions than answers. <laughs> remember that uh, <laughs> as I asked lots of questions um thanks well first of all thanks Ben um really interesting and yeah as you say very much a, a sort of a whistle stop tour through um independent learning and lots I think to um to revisit and watch again uh, there were a few questions about whether it's possible to watch the recording um and that and just to say that that will be the case and we will be putting a version or we will be putting the recording on teaching English a little bit later, uh, hopefully a little bit later today, but certainly tomorrow. Um, and lots of really nice comments actually for you. I don't know if you can see in the Q&A, there's a really nice comment from Fernando Akithi uh, saying, Ben, your webinar is not only uh, on independent learning, but also a class on how to give a webinar. Uh, clear, <laughs> well-organized, with excellent theory. He goes on, uh, there's more. Uh, excellent theory, visuals, examples are most important, very engaging. And thank useful you so thank, you. thank you so very much and that's lots of kind of similar comments um questions please do put your questions into the chat into the into the the q a uh okay yes certificate yes you get a certificate i did mention that at the beginning i have put uh comments into the chat about how you get the certificate basically wait until tomorrow when you get your uh thank you for um joining email um where should we start from or with really struggling learners so that's just the next question that i've seen i don't know if that's a that's one to start with um which, hafsa, which where is that one from hafsa asad in the q a uh, where should we start so i think i think you know yeah. the independent learners where you've got really students who are really struggling yeah 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 i mean it, i think it's the same advice but it's taking it much more slowly um and uh that transition from teacher directing things to teacher helping to the students taking control is um, can take a long time for some. 
and it depends on whether other, you know, if other teachers in the school are trying to do the same thing, it's easier for you. If they're not, it's, you know, it's more of the burden is on you. So, I, you know, you really have to recognize that for some students, it'll be a slow process that you build up. Um, but um, part of this, when you mean struggling learners, if you mean they're struggling to take control, then I think it's just uh, supporting them and scaffolding and et cetera. If you mean that their English is very weak, then I think this is still important for them because this is part of the, the justification for this approach is that students who are struggling can work at their speed and their pace and can focus on the things that they're struggling with and not have to work at the same pace as the ones who uh, are finding it quite easy. So I, I would definitely continue with this kind of approach, even if the students have got low English. Um, if they're struggling to take control, I think you just have to give more and more support. Don't, don't throw them in the deep end and, and then worry about them drowning. Mm -hmm. okay. um, at the top, I, I'm just scrolling to the top. Is it a good idea teenagers uh, can watch a film in English with English subtitles in order they understand better the story? Yeah, I think so. I think, I think it's, um, it's, you know, it's one of the stages to mastering the language. Uh, and I know from my own experience of trying to learn a language, if I can see the subtitles, it's really helpful to hear better. So definitely, I mean, you don't want to, you want to, they, they need to have opportunities to listen without subtitles, but I think it, it's definitely a good thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Um, I suppose one of the questions I wanted to ask was around with the, the strategies that you're talking about are applicable in face-to-face -face and kind of remote teaching context i don't know i mean obviously more of the research has been done into kind of learner autonomy and so on in in a face-to-face -face context because that's what we're familiar with has there been is, is there research ongoing into into the same thing but through um kind of either synchronous or asynchronous remote teaching context that, yeah know. um yeah i i would say all of this i mean well we've kind of been in the situation nearly for two years so th there is res research but even with even within that, when you say synchronous and asynchronous, there's so much variety that mm. I think people it's difficult to say it's research rather than the, there's a lot of anecdotes and, and personal experience. But um, I mean, again, I think in in reality that the, the way that you do things will vary if this is um, online. But actually, the principles are the same. So you just you, you're still mm. looking to support things. You're still trying to take things by step by step you're still trying to encourage them to think about their own learning to self-assess mm. so um i don't think it's as variable as uh, you know as people worry it's it's, it's quite surface techniques mm -hmm. okay um okay uh the, 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 the most oh, there's lots here um someone's thanking the bbc um thank you i'm sure the bbc would be very appreciative uh for something that wasn't theirs um Paul, there's a, there's a question there about um, they know words for level C1, but they cannot use them during conversation. I mean, this is a, this is the the thing about language learning is that combination of skill, knowledge, and skill. Um, and for a lot of learners, they will focus very much on the knowledge part. But the thing about language is that you have to practice it until you can use it semi-automatically. Otherwise, it's not really useful. Yeah. Um, and so, getting students to understand that language is a little different from say physics or maths or other things in that sense that, that you have to keep practicing things knowledge is is not enough and um, i think that's that's one one of the things as a language teacher we have to uh, persuade people mm -hmm. health healthy competition in class uh i have a student who's incredible some are not and they give up easily yeah i know i know i think um and this is where you do have to be careful about competition um i mean putting strong and weak together can help um just not putting people who are very different in competition with each other um yeah is obviously as a teacher you're going to have to manage that but you don't they don't all have to be doing the same competition if you see what i mean you can have little mini competitions going on in a class okay um so there's one of that uh using l1 uh there's a few questions about that about translation and kind of getting students to use L1 and how that kind of marries with independent learning Any opinions on on that. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm, um, I, I'm looking here at um, how do you deal with students who have zero motivation? That okay. seems a serious psychological issue to me. I don't have many such cases. And, and definitely, uh, obviously, when you're in schools, you, you've got people who are coming with you know, complex backgrounds. And sometimes you as a teacher can't overcome those easily. Mm -hmm. um, there, there, there are many complications. Um, uh, I think in most cases, we're trying to deal with people who've got weak motivation and we're trying to build up their motivation by trying to make them believe that they can do things, giving them tasks which are small enough to achieve, and then that builds up confidence. Mm -hmm. um, so it's building up confidence and belief in themselves, I think is, is one of the things, but also giving them more control, choice over what they do. These, these are the techniques. Um, but uh, when you say one or two every year is no um, motivation, I suspect you're talking about you know, issues which are outside the classroom, which uh, will depend on how your school manages mm -hmm. those. Mm -hmm. Okay. You want time for one more, and then we'll okay. finish off. You can choose one. Okay, I choose one. Uh, how to get students to check themselves without interruptions? Um, Actually, no, I realized I didn't quite understand that question. <laughs> uh, maybe I shouldn't have chosen. Check themselves as in, uh, you know, assess themselves without interruptions. By interruptions, I think that the teacher means um, able to um, uh, not ask the teacher. I think uh, I'm conscious of the, I haven't gone over the time, Paul. That's why. That's okay. No, that's okay. That's um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it's about having those criteria for evaluating. Um, so that they can peer assess, they've got guidance on how to check mm -hmm. themselves, um, and then they only need to come to you if something is not clear in that guidance. So I think the more support and um, guidance you give on the assessment, the less interruption. Okay. Okay. All right, we'll leave it there. Um, actually, one of the things I just I picked up on what you said quite near the beginning about learning taking longer than there was time for, kind of in the in the classroom. I think it's a huge sort of motivation if people feel they want to really learn. They're not going to learn by just sitting in a classroom um, for that amount of time that there is. Um, so, yeah. So yeah. Um, Ben, thanks ever so much. Really, um, really great to, um, to sort of see you uh, virtually. And uh, and thanks very much for the session. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Lots and lots of fantastic comments. I think everyone's got a lot out of that. So um, thank you. Um, Paul, Paul, I just want to say I'm also sharing the slides. So I'll send the slides to you and, and you can uh, put them on the site. Um, great. That'd be great. Brilliant. Yes, that will be available later with some of the slides and the recording will be available later today to anyone who's asking. So great. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.